Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about virtual machines and microkernels, two topics which are closely related to operating systems and which form, as a technology, the basis of much of the infrastructure we use on the internet and in cloud computing today. So we will be talking about software architecture quite a bit today. So if you look up a definition of software architecture, you'll find something like this. So software architecture is the basic organization of a system expressed through its components, their relations to each other and the environment, as well as the principles which define the design evolution of a system. So an intuitive view of this might be drawing some boxes and arrows, but that does not describe the detailed design. So what we're interested in today is the focus on the relation between the requirements to a system and the system, so especially the system software, that is to be constructed according to these requirements. So for different operating systems architectures, we have technical criteria, so principles of construction, as well as what we call observable criteria. This is requirements to the system. So technical criteria can include topics such as isolation. So can we actually achieve uh, the objective that one process is unable to change or uh, analyze the memory contents of another process or the operating system? We have uh, technical criteria for interaction mechanisms. So we have different inter interaction mechanisms we've seen already, like shared memory or inter-process communication, and also maybe interrupt handling mechanisms. And for observable criteria, so requirements we want to ask of our system, we have uh, at least these four. One is adaptability. So how easy is it to port a system to a different hardware architecture? How easy is it to make modifications to the system? We have extensibility. So how easy is it to add new functions and services to an operating system? Then we have robustness. So what's the behavior of the system in the presence of errors? And finally, we have the performance of the system as a yet another observable criterion. So very early computers did not have any operating system at all. So you just had a bit of hardware and then you as a programmer had to have had to had control over all of the hardware, but you had to control all of the hardware. So every program had to implement all the code to implement uh, whatever functionality was required to be executed on that hardware you're using. So systems were running batch processing jobs controlled by an operator, so you didn't have direct access to a computer, but you handed in a job, for example, on a set of punch cards to an operator. That operator then fed your set of punch cards to the machine, pressed the button to start the machine, and then your program was executed and either it worked, so you got a printed output or you got an error message back. So this was single tasking, this was operated in a very primitive way and this was running in batch processing mode, so one job after the other. And the peripheral devices that could be controlled were rather simple, which was good because you had to write code for doing this yourself. So those were maybe tape drives, punch card readers and writers and printers all connected over serial lines, so essentially providing character-based input and output. Now, this resulted in a large-scale replication of code, so each programmer who wrote a program for that specific computer had to write code for handling your printer and handling your tape drive and whatever uh, on his or her own. So uh, you had replication of code to control devices in every application program, which resulted in a big waste of development and compile time, and also in a waste of back then very valuable and expensive storage space, because all that code was included in each program. So it was stored multiple times instead of just being in one convenient location. And of course, this was also error prone because when you, for example, copied an early version of device handling routines from a fellow programmer, and this fellow programmer made some bug fixes to his code and never gave them to you, then you continued with this erroneous code where someone else had a fixed version of that code. So this was clearly not an ideal situation in the beginning, so the 1950s, for example. Of course, people were aware of problems like these, so they started to collect frequently used functions to control devices in sort of a software library, and this software library was then made available for all programs and all programmers. 
Now these were just like a library you would use in your C program like libc. So you would just call system functions like you would call a regular program function. But this library could remain in the computer's main memory because you assumed that all of the programs running on the machine, or most of them at least, would actually make use of that library. So it made sense to load it once when you powered up the machine and keep it in memory. And then you had some like fixed locations in your instruction memory you could jump to. And these locations were well known. So programmers could actually use these to call functions of your library operating system. Now there's a big advantage. These library functions, uh, which we also call resident monitor, well, reduced program loading times. Well, because you only loaded the part of your program that was implementing your program's functionality, and you didn't have to load part of your program that was implementing device drivers because those were already resident in memory. And the other advantage is that many people use this functionality. So over time, these library functions of your library operating system got well documented and well tested. So you had bug fixes, you had improvements and so on, which reduced the development overhead for all of the application programmers. And you had an additional advantage that errors in this library operating system could be fixed centrally. So there was one location which kept track of the source code of changes and of bugs. And if you fixed an error in this library, this error would be fixed for all of the programs uh, that were using the library when they were loaded. So this was essentially some sort of an early shared library because it was not linked to the programs themselves, but it was loaded into memory when the system was started before the first application program was started. And thus it was able to improve the reliability of your system quite a bit. So this is a simplified view of a system using a library operating system. So on the bottom, you have your hardware and the blue box here uh, represents your library operating system, which, ha which has some simple functions for like character based IO, maybe also early block based IO for early disks, and maybe some sort of simple memory management to allocate and free memory. On top of this, you had the application, but your application could still also access the hardware directly. So if a programmer decided uh, that some special functionality was needed by the hardware, which was not provided by the library OS, or if it was simply an old application that was written before this library OS was introduced, there was no, nothing hindering you from accessing the hardware directly. Of course, doing both at the same time using the library OS and accessing the hardware directly would be problematic because maybe the library operating system assumes that uh, some certain state of the hardware is actually given when it accesses the hardware. And this could have been changed when you access the hardware directly. Accordingly, there was no distinction between different modes of a system. So you had access to all of your hardware, to all of your peripherals. So you only had a system running in what we call system mode later on, because there was no notion of any different modes in your system. So, as with all upcoming operating systems in this lecture, we're going to evaluate library OSs according to a number of criteria we've discussed in the beginning. So our technical criteria, what's about isolation? Now the isolation was ideal because the system was a single tasking system. So you loaded a job, you executed it, and then you removed this complete application from memory before you loaded the next one. So you didn't have a chance to access any other program's data in memory because there was no other program running at the same time. But of course, you needed a high time overhead to switch tasks because you had to erase your memory. You had to load a new program from a set of punched cards, which takes quite some time. The interaction of programs with the operating system was direct. So you had function calls calling your library operating system. Um, you had so, sorts of interrupts uh, and interrupt handling uh, depending on your hardware. Sometimes you didn't have interrupts at all. So uh, your program was actually restricted to use polling for operating hardware devices, which of course reduced the available CPU time. The adaptability of the system was uh, difficult because if you started to write a library for your computer you had here, back then computers were in the early 50s, uh, separate developments. So there was no standards, there was no compatibility anywhere. So you developed a library and it worked only on your type of machine, but not on any other machine. 
So you had separate libraries for each hardware architecture. There were no standards around. Extensibility greatly depended on the library structure. So very often these early libraries, because they were in an assembler and you didn't have lots of experience with uh, designing large software systems. So these uh, early library operating systems tended to have like lots of global data structures and global variables and what we call spaghetti code. So just jumping around using jump or go to statements widely, which makes your code hard to maintain and change. The robustness wasn't that good because, well, you had direct control of all hardware. So any error that occurred because you were uh, accessing the hardware in an incorrect way, or maybe you had an error reading a punched card or tape, would probably result in a system halt. So this would result in your program being abnormally terminated. Uh, the performance, however, was very high because you had direct operations on the hardware. You didn't have to cross any privilege borders. You didn't have to cope with privilege mechanisms. So essentially, you could really exploit the performance of these early computer systems. And you really had to because these systems were very slow. So they executed on the order of maybe several hundred thousands instructions per second instead of billions of instructions, which we are used to today. So what's our verdict of library OSs? Let's discuss this now. So computer hardware back then was really, really expensive. So in the many million dollar area, and this extensive, expensive hardware could only be used in a productive way for a small fraction of the time because it took so much time to load a new task. And in this time you were unable to use your computer for computing. And if you had to use polling, waiting for I.O. unnecessarily wasted time since only one process runs on the system. So if you have to wait for the completion of an I.O. operation on a very slow I.O. device at that, you couldn't do anything in between because you were the only process and things like multi-threading were not invented yet. So obtaining results took a lot of time because you had a waiting queue. You just submitted your job to the operator and then the operator took your jobs one after the other, fed them to the machine, uh, obtained the results and then took the next job. So this is batch processing and it sometimes took like uh, maybe several hours or a day to get results of your program back. And if this was a compiler run, for example, and you had a typo in your program, then uh, you had turnaround times, which were far too long to do this in any interactive manner. So back then, programmers really, really painstakingly checked for the correctness of their programs before they handed something in. Something we're not used to today because compilation is so fast. You can work in a trial and error way, uh, just, you know, trying out some feature, uh, throwing it at the compiler and see if the compiler actually likes it or if the compiler complains about anything. So back in these early days, you had no interactivity at all because the system was run by a specialized operator who did not give you any access to the hardware. Sometimes you could see it behind glass walls, but usually your computer was a big machine hidden somewhere in the basement in the computing center. And you only operated with your computer using a set of punched cards, which are just slices of paper. And again, sets of output printed on paper again. So computing was very different to what we're used to today. And of course, this also means you not, had no way to interactively work with the machine. So a program that just reads a value from a keyboard like we're used to today was impossible. So you had to provide all your data as an input for your program in advance. Execution of a program could not be controlled at runtime. So this was severely restricting. So a follow-up development to a library operating system resulted in the requirements of doing accounting on a machine. So back in the early days, you had to pay for compute time. And sometimes, you know, a minute of compute time costs several dollars. So uh, essentially, because the machine costs several million dollars, uh, the operator had to recoup the costs, uh, the costs for buying and operating the machine. So uh, the management for this computer hardware they were using back then wanted to have some sort of accounting system resources. So how many pages did you print? How many seconds of CPU time did you use? How much memory did you use? And to do this, they needed complete control over the hard and software of a system. So this resulted in applications now running under the control of a system, which was called operating system later on. 
and systems with multiple processes were feasible now because applications could control when uh, no, the operating system could control when an application uh, was allowed to use the CPU and the certain peripheral devices. So uh, we could switch between several processes now running or being in memory at the same time. And this was what was called multiprocessing. So in order to enable this separation of control over your machine, we needed to introduce a privilege system. So we have uh, two system modes now, a, a mode in which complete access to your hardware was allowed, the so-called system mode. So this is the mode your operating system runs in and a mode which restricts application to uh, at, uh, applications by, to access hardware. So the application mode where applications had to request access to hardware resources through the operating system. And when this uh, re access was requested, the operating system also could do some accounting to figure out how much it cost you to execute your program. So uh, in many computers, this distinction between the mode and the switch between the modes was hardware supported. And as I said, direct hardware access was only available now in system mode, so only to the operating systems. Accordingly, you were no longer able to just call operating system functionality as you have called it in library operating systems by just jumping somewhere in memory because you should not be allowed to call an arbitrary piece of code inside of the operating system, but only controlled pieces of code which you are allowed to use. So essentially there had to be some gateway mechanism to control access to your operating system. And this is what's called well, system calls nowadays or software traps. So essentially a special instruction for the CPU of your computer to tell your computer, please execute a mode change to system mode. So and this mode change involved jumping to a very specific location in memory. And at this location, your system call handler, part of the operating system was located. And this system call handler first checked if you were allowed to do the operation you requested and then did some accounting and eventually executed the functionality you requested. So this requires context switching and saving of contexts between the application and the operating system and also between different applications uh, between which you want to switch. So this involved quite a bit of overhead already. So the structure of a monolithic operating system might look like this. We have the hardware on the bottom and then also in system mode we have our monolithic operating system kernel running and this operating system now includes all of the functionality that's required to access or multiplex the hardware so it has interrupt handling it has device drivers for character devices like serial lines or printers it has device drivers for block io devices like disks it does some sort of memory management so it multiplexes memory between different applications. It has a scheduler to multiplex the CPU and in later systems, you also had a file system that provided the abstraction of having names and access rights instead of accessing disk blocks directly. And then in user mode, you had one or more applications and these applications had to use this specific system call or trap interface to talk to the monolithic kernel. So to request a service from the kernel and get some results back which involved a bit of overhead because switching between user and system mode and back requires that you save the state of the application, then change to system mode. So run your operating system kernel and restore the state when you return results to your application uh, after you executed the functionality. So one early example for such a monolithic system is OS 360, the uh, operating system for IBM 360 series mainframes developed from 1966 on. And the objective of OS 360 was to first to provide a common batch processing operating system for all IBM mainframes. So you didn't buy a single mainframe model, but there were very small and slow mainframe models for customers who didn't need that much compute power or didn't have that much money. And there were also very big machines for customers that had lots of computation to do or lots of data to process. And back then, usually you didn't buy a computer, but you rented a computer. So renting a computer could cost between several thousand dollars per month for a very small and slow machine and several million dollars per month for a machine, for example, running the operations of a big bank. So uh, accordingly, the OS 360 operating system was available in a number of different configurations according to the features your machine actually supported. So the machine you rented from IBM. 
So the most primitive system was called PCP, primary control program here. So PCP was just a process, uh, a system uh, supporting a single process at a time and supporting small systems. Then you had for a bit larger systems, the MFT, multi-programmer with fixed number of tasks, which was for these mid-scale systems with as much as 256 kilobytes of RAM. And this uh, provided fixed partitioning of memory between different processes. So we had multi-processing or multitasking, uh, but you had a fixed number of tasks. So this was quite restricted. And only on the largest machines, you had a system called MVT, so multi-program with variable number of tasks. So this was provided for high-end systems. This supported swapping to external disk. This even had an optional time-sharing option where you could allow your users to have interactive sessions with your very expensive machines. Now OS360 had a number of innovative properties. So it was one of the first operating systems providing a hierarchical file system as we're used to today. It provided processes that could control sub-processes themselves, so something similar to what we know from Fork in Unix. And we had compatible systems. So essentially, if you started with a mid-scale machine running MFT and you wrote a lot of software for this, and then you figured out you need a bigger machine, so you upgraded that machine to a large-scale machine running MVT, so uh, you could continue to execute all the programs that were running on the old MFT system. So those were not only API compatible, so supporting the same set of function calls and parameters, but also application binary interface compatible, ABI compatible, which means you could run your compiled binary programs unchanged on the bigger machine, even if this machine was orders of magnitude faster. And the nice thing, if you uh, buy an IBM mainframe today, so if you have several millions of dollars left over on your bank account, uh, you get an operating system, which is today called ZOS by IBM. And this still supports running all the old OS 360 applications from the 1960s, because there are, well, long running traditional uh, applications like in the banking or insurance industry that still rely on some code implemented in the 1960s where the programmers of this software are not only retired, but probably no longer alive. And uh, since this is such a business critical piece of software, nobody dares to change anything in this piece of software. And so IBM painstakingly really takes care of maintaining compatibility so that even on your most modern machine, you can run some sort of punch card emulation to input data uh, which was maybe uh, entered in the 1960s for people having life insurance or stuff like that. So that's pretty amazing. And that shows how brittle much of the infrastructure actually is uh, that lots of our modern world uh, relies upon. However, OS 360 was quite a big undertaking. And as soon as the project was started, a lot of problems in the domain of operating system development showed up that were that apparent because systems before didn't take care of compatibility. They didn't have to span classes of machines which had orders of magnitude uh, of a difference between computing power and available memory and other features like having uh, memory protection or not. And uh, actually this project failed spectacularly. And there's a great book I really recommend everyone to read who's going to develop software later on, so not only operating system. And this was written by the manager of the OS 360 operating system development project at IBM, a guy called Fred Brooks. And this book is called The Mythical Man Months. And this describes all the problems that occurred during the development of this OS 360 system. And it's great to read. So from this book, for example, uh, there's uh, a number of interesting things that you can learn, like when they figured out they were late with their operating systems, uh, so essentially the system would not be ready when IBM wanted to introduce the hardware. Then they tried to hire additional programmers to the project, so increasing the size of the team working on this operating system by a, a significant number, and they figured out that actually increasing manpower to a late project only makes it later because now the people working on that project already have to uh, spend some of their time 
to teach the new people how to use the system, how to program for the system. And then, of course, those people make additional errors. You get more code in your system. So essentially, this was quite a bit of a fiasco. Nevertheless, uh, some of the things learned from OS 360 were some of the things that are important in operating system development still today. Now, one of the concepts that is really important here is what we call conceptual integrity. So back then, programmers were used to more or less directly program to the hardware they were given, so to a specific machine. Now, for this IBM 360 series, you had this family of compatible mainframes from very small systems to very large systems. And if a programmer was given a very large machine to implement an operating system on, then it would probably perform very badly or not at all because it would run out of memory on a small machine. So what was difficult was to separate the architecture of the operating system, so which features should it support in which way, and the implementation of it, because back then it was just one and the same. And developers love to exploit all the technical capabilities of a system, which in turn reduces the comprehensibility of the code and also developer productivity because switching to a different machine or making small changes to the hardware afterwards can result in requiring lots of hardware changes. Microsoft actually tried to learn from this failure, so they seem to have read the Mythical Man Month book. So when Windows NT was developed initially in the early 1990s, Programmers at Microsoft were usually used to having the latest Intel x86 machines. So back then a very fast 386 or maybe an early very expensive 486 machine. And they knew all the tricks of these machines and they exploited them uh, even using undocumented features that the CPU vendors uh, never thought of, but which were possible because of compatibility between the architectures. So when Microsoft started NT development, which is what you know as Windows 10 today, Microsoft gave their developers a completely different machine, a machine based on a MIPS processor, a MIPS you might know from your computer architecture course. And that's just because uh, Microsoft wanted their programmers to be unable to exploit any of the tricks they learned over the last 10 or 15 years working with Intel machines and having such a clean separation of architecture and implementation. And this resulted in Windows NT actually being very portable. So versions of Windows NT in the 1990s were available, of course, for Intel x86 machines, for MIPS machines, also for DEC Alpha 64-bit machines, and also for Motorola PowerPC machines. So this was a very portable system. Now, unfortunately, most of these hardware platforms never made a big impact uh, on the market. So the ports to MIPS and Alpha and PowerPC were, well, uh, just cancelled very early on and there were only ports for x86 machines available. But Microsoft has to change this now because they're also transitioning, like Apple, to also support modern ARM platforms, which show a number of significant advantages, for example, in performance and energy consumption compared to traditional x86 platforms. Another problem that showed up in OS 360 is that many of the programmers working on that project had worked on a different operating system before. And of course, they had noticed with this previous system all the uh, disadvantages and drawbacks this system had. So they wanted to make it better. They wanted to build the perfect operating system as their next project with OS 360. And this is what results in the so-called second system effect. So developers wanted to have all the features, wanted to fix all the errors of the previous system. And this means they actually never managed to finish it. This might also have been a management error because of not being willing or not being able to constrain the programmers, uh, well, outreach to implement features, stuff like this. So this second system effect showed in many large software systems, not only operating systems that have been developed because of experiences with the first system that was simply unsatisfying. And finally, for a large system like OS 360, the dependencies between the different components of the system. So, for example, memory management, file system and scheduler were growing too complex to handle, especially with primitive tools that were available in the 1960s. So uh, the developers figured out that starting with a certain size of the operating system codes 
Uh, lots of errors showed up, which were not simple like typos or stuff like that, but which were more complex errors uh, that were related to uh, a misunderstanding or uh, incorrect implementation of the interaction between components. So essentially when you called a, compo a function in a different component, you assumed something about what this function was doing, but it was doing something slightly differently. And this was an error that showed up only in some corner cases. So these errors were very difficult to diagnose and even more difficult to fix. And all these errors showed up in OS 360. And that's why this operating system was also spectacularly late. And you can read all about this in that book. And what's interesting is that developments in software technology and software engineering we know today were mostly driven by developments in operating systems. So for a long time, operating systems and also compilers were thought to be the most complex pieces of software that were developed. Well, nowadays, it's probably a web browser, which is the most complex piece of software because it includes a compiler, for example, for JavaScript, including a JIT compiler. It includes sort of its own scheduling and networking stuff and so on. So essentially, some people already say the browser is the new operating system because it replicates lots of the functionality in order to provide a compatible platform. So no matter if you have a slow smartphone with an ARM processor or a modern x86 Windows phone or RISC-V Linux machine, uh, your web application should work all the same when you, for example, use a web browser and then you have different web browsers, of course, which also try to be compatible with each other. So your JavaScript code from your banking website works on Firefox and Chrome and Microsoft Edge and whatever you can imagine there. So uh, all this started in the 1960s when really software got serious and the problems that showed up were even more serious as a consequence. So another example of a monolithic system that was developed is Unix, obviously. So Unix was actually developed by a number of frustrated guys at AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, AT&T Bell Labs in the late 1960s participated in a large scale operating system development with a number of different companies like General Electric, for example, and uh, universities uh, to develop the best operating system that was out there. And that operating system was called Multix, Multiplexed Information and Computing Services. And this Multix operating system implemented a number of uh, features which were not available and not heard of uh, in any other system at that time. Unfortunately, this also required a very expensive computer. And on this very expensive computer, which had like, uh, well, cost like several tens of millions of dollars. The system was so slow and had so much overhead that you could mm, at most run two or three users at the same time in interactive use. That was not what was really expected by AT&T Bell Labs. So AT&T Bell Labs withdrew from that project and some of the researchers working on that project were actually left without something to do. And so after working for years on this complex and difficult project, they wanted some fun. And so they started writing a computer game in their, well, probably work time. Nobody really knows. Now, the problem was that back then you just couldn't go to any shop around the corner and buy a computer because it was the late 1960s. So even small computers were very expensive, like several tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, you had to find a computer to do stuff like that. And so the, I can imagine those guys went to the basement of, of their research lab and found a very uh, old and unused computer ca gathering dust. And that was a PDP-7, which was by then already several years old. So it was slow and only had a couple of kilobytes of memory, but still it was better than nothing. And then, uh, well, these guys started writing a game. So this computer already had a graphics display, which was unusual at that time. And uh, many of the people working on operating systems back then had a background in mathematics and physics, because back then uh, most universities didn't offer uh, explicit computer science programs. So what happens is they wanted to have a space shooting game. So you had rockets, which uh, you could control and shoot at each other, but including real uh, emulated physics. So you had gravity from the sun and from planets uh, interacting with your rocket and stuff like this. You had trajectories, so you had real physics. And what they did is they started writing that game. And uh, well, 
they figured out oh they needed to store uh, to score like uh, to store like high scores they needed to uh, read configuration files so they actually needed some sort of an operating system and since these guys were actually operating systems developers well they started to write an operating system obviously and they started to write it on the puny pdp7 machine in assembler and figured out that writing an operating system in assembler again is not a lot of fun so they should do something better and they were also knowledgeable about compilers so they started to get the idea of implementing an operating system in a high level language and they designed their own high level language for this and this is what we know as c today there was an intermediate step called b which was still an interpreted language but c was the first real compiler now they got lucky and they could uh, afford a bigger machine a pdp 11 a couple of years later and then they figured out because that was uh, a machine from the same manufacturer but it was a completely different hardware architecture that porting the assembler code of their system they called unix which is a pun on multics so multics stands for multiplexed information and computing services and since unix could only support a single user on that slow machine this was uniplexed information and computing systems and then they wrote it with an x at the end instead of cs so this unix system to port it, they would have actually had to rewrite it from one assembler on the PDP-7 to another uh, version of assembler code for the PDP-11 processor. And of course, that was a lot of work. So they had the idea of, instead of yeah, doing it all over again for the next port, they would try to implement the operating system kernel in a high-level language. And for this, they wrote their own language and compiler for this. Now. Uh, this was a large undertaking and mostly unheard of because back then compilers weren't very efficient. So the code they generated was maybe an order of magnitude slower than code that an experienced programmer could write by hand. And this is why C is so close to the hardware because the Unix developers actually wanted to exploit all these nice features of their hardware without paying some sort of performance penalty. And so that's why Unix remained still small and easy to use, at least in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, it was mostly a development at these Bell Research Labs. And the kernel size, for example, for 7th edition Unix in 1979 was still small. So it was about 10,000 lines of C code with a bit of assembler code. That was straightforward, that was easy to handle, and a single programmer could actually understand the whole kernel source code. And if you compiled it with your uh, C compiler, but then it came out as about 50 kilobytes of binary code, which was very reasonable. So computers back then had between several hundred kilobytes and maybe two megabytes of memory. And this Unix system was so simple and small that it could be originally implemented by two to three developers. So Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, for example, people you might have heard about already when you have read something about Unix. And the interesting thing is that Unix actually tried to implement simple abstractions. And some of these abstractions we've already talked about. So every object in the system can be represented as a file. Files themselves are just simple unformatted streams of characters or bytes compared to different operating systems which provide some sort of database functionality uh, in file systems. And we've already seen that complex functionality of the system can be realized by combining simple system programs, for example, using shell pipelines. So you wrote small programs that did one thing well, and then to build more complex functionality, you combined these programs like a set program to do character replacement and a sort program to sort something alphabetically. And one of the new objectives for operating system development introduced by Unix was to introduce portability, so to enable simple adaptability of the system to different hardware. And this was achieved by developing the C language and developing in turn the Unix operating system kernel in C. And C was designed to be a domain specific language to develop operating systems. And if you're interested in the development of Unix and C, all this early Unix source code was open sourced a, a number of years ago. And there's a uh, Unix History Society, TUHS.org, where you can actually download all the source code and even a PDP 11 emulator. And so you can actually look at different versions of Unix. You can try to run it. And amazingly, for example, if you run 7th uh, edition Unix from 1979, it feels more or less like a modern Unix. Of course, you don't have many of the comfortable features of, of today, like 
uh, well, command line completions, for example, or graphical user interfaces. But on the command line, if you know modern Unix, it's easy to use such an ancient Unix. But of course, well, you're restricted by the low amount of memory, by the low amount of disk space you had. So, of course, there's some constraints you have to adhere to here. So the uh, subsequent success of Unix caught the developers a bit by surprise. So after they grew out of the capabilities of their PDP-11, they managed to get a larger machine, which was the first 32-bit machine they could get, a so-called VAX by digital equipment. And uh, these systems with large address spaces, so you could address now like four gigabytes of memory, even though you could maybe afford one megabyte of memory initially because a megabyte of memory was already several tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, still, you had these large virtual address spaces later on with RISC systems, which started existing in the early 1980s. And accordingly, the Unix kernel also grew in features and in size. So uh, early Unix systems were actually handed out for a nominal fee, so mostly for writing uh, the code to tape and sending it out to universities. So back in the 1970s, it was mostly, well, Unix, which was taught in operating systems courses at universities, because all the other operating systems were actually closed sources. So you could take a look at how they worked. And with Unix, you got all the source code. It was small enough. So you could actually explain to your students how Unix worked. Now, uh, in the 1980s, then uh, AT&T actually tried to make money with Unix, so they commercialized Unix. And after System 7, there were several commercial systems like System 3 and System 5, and also research systems like BSD Unix coming from uh, the University of Berkeley in California. And they added a lot of features, features requested by uh, commercial customers and features requested by researchers. And one of the biggest features that was integrated in these 1980s Unix systems was TCP IP networking. So these were the early days of the internet where you had so many different systems to interconnect and everyone wanted to participate in the internet. So you had to provide code to implement this common set of protocols, the TCP IP protocols. And this was a very complex subsystem to be integrated. So BSD, Unix, Berkeley Unix did it as one of the first versions. There were also some commercial versions out there, but BSD was the most uh, widely used implementation. And in these early BSD Unix versions, the whole TCP IP protocol stack plus Ethernet card or whatever card drivers you had was about as complex as the rest of the kernel. And you can still see some remnants of this today when you have very complex protocols. For example, if you want to program a Raspberry Pi today on a bare metal level, so if you want to write your own operating system for a Raspberry Pi, features like accessing the SD card or even the frame buffer to draw graphics, that's relatively simple and requires maybe a few dozen or hundred lines of code. However, if you want to talk to a USB keyboard or mouse, and these protocols are very complicated, this unfortunately requires several thousand lines of code. So uh, this is very difficult to get right. And accordingly, many people starting or wanting to start an operating system on their own running on a Raspberry Pi actually stop at this USB driver level because this is just far too complex and is probably more complex than the rest of the system they're trying to write. Now, there are some USB libraries out there you can reuse for the Raspberry Pi, but all of them have some problems. If you're interested in details, let us know. Uh, we can give you some hints and links to this. And of course, uh, monolithic systems not only include these ancient Unix systems, but they also include Linux. So Linux was, as you probably know, written by a Finnish student, Linus Torvalds, uh, in the uh, early 1990s uh, in Helsinki, while he was supposed to be studying for his computer science exams. He didn't. Uh, he had more fun writing an operating system for his shiny new 386 computer. And the only thing he had available in his university library were books describing the API and the structure of System 5 Unix. And that's what he modeled his system after. And that's something you can still see in Linux today. And so Linux actually is more or less also such a monolithic system. And there was an interesting discussion. So when Linus Torvalds announced his, well, early version, the first version of the Linux system on, well, Usenet. So Usenet is an early uh, 
forum system, which was a distributed system, so a bit similar to what maybe Reddit is today or Hacker News, but more civilized and uh, not centralized. Uh, so actually it was an improvement over what come later. And when uh, Linus Torvalds actually announced his Linux system in a so-called news group, so a discussion group, which was called CompOS Minix for a academic operating system, by a colleague in uh, Amsterdam, Andy Tannenbaum, who wrote the Minix system as a simple 7th edition like Unix used for education. And he announced his Linux system there and Andy Tannenbaum took a look at Linus Torvalds code and just said, if you were one of my students, you'd get a very low grade for this system you developed because this is like late 1970s technology. You should know better. Go and read my book. Well, you know which system won out. Well, it was not Minix, uh, but uh, that's an interesting thing to read. And there's also a whole book about the early Linux developments. So uh, yeah, if you're interested in a bit of history, uh, there's, it's certainly fun to read about this. Now, the interesting uh, impact this open source policy of early Unix had, as I already mentioned, that uh, the availability of source code it's not open source as we know today, where you're allowed to hand out the source code to anyone, but it was available at all universities. So students were used to it. And when they worked at companies later or founded companies later, like Sun Microsystems, for example, which was founded out of Stanford University, they actually took Unix along with them, sometimes legally, sometimes not that legally. And they built products based on this, like Sun workstations for as one example, which were based on BSD, Berkeley Unix, uh, back then in the early 1980s. And so this had an impact on people coming out of academia, going to industry, propagated Unix instead of proprietary systems. And that's how Linus Torvalds got to know, uh, well, Unix years later, and then built a clone of it because he couldn't afford to buy a commercial Unix system for the PC he was using. Now, of course, Unix wasn't perfect and Unix isn't perfect. So Unix has a lot of weaknesses and these weaknesses of Unix led to new research questions, led to new projects, led to follow up developments in operating systems. And some of these we're going to talk about in this lecture today. Nevertheless, many projects, for example, a follow up project at Carnegie Mellon University called Mach, uh, tried to remain compatible to Unix because people wanted to work on operating systems. They didn't want to reinvent the whole system, including user mode programs, system programs, and so on. So nobody wants to write an editor when one actually wants to write an operating system kernel. So you need some existing software that's easy to reuse. So Unix actually remained a model for many research operating systems that came after it and still is today, I suppose. So how do these monolithic systems fare? Let's evaluate them. So isolation in kernel mode is bad because it's, as we said, a monolithic system. So the operating system kernel is just one big program. And uh, this means that uh, there is no separate address space between different components of your operating system. So if there's a bug in one of your device drivers, for example, and there's a pointer that's incorrect, the device driver could, for example, override buffers used by the file system or even code used by the file system. So that's not ideal, especially since device drivers in most operating systems are a major source of bugs. So the only isolation you had in these monolithic systems were between applications and between the application and the operating system. So an application only had controlled access to your operating system kernel. The interaction methods uh, were uh, different regarding on which uh, mode of the system we were. So inside of the kernel, you just use direct function calls. So your uh, file system driver would, for example, call a function of your block device driver directly, uh, whereas you use traps, as we've seen, to communicate between the application and the kernel. So there was some sort of uh, more structured interaction when an application was requesting kernel services. Interrupt handling was working directly, so the kernel implemented and installed interrupt handlers, which were uh, supplied as part usually of your device drivers for a timer or a disk or a serial line. Adaptability was easy. However, 
changes in one component uh, had the tendency to influence other components negatively. So you really had to be careful what to change inside of your operating system kernel in order to still have a working system afterwards. Extensibility of these monolithic systems originally was not that great. So for example, early Unix systems, when you wanted to add a device driver or add some functionality to the kernel, you actually had to recompile your whole kernel. So especially with devices that came later that are hot plugged, like, like a USB stick or something like this, this became very tedious. So today in Linux and many other systems, you have a kernel module system, so loadable kernel extensions, loadable device drivers that can be loaded at runtime and also unloaded when you no longer need them. And so you don't have to recompile your kernel, you just have to load a new model or you can compile new models separately that can be loaded into an existing kernel. Now as a result of lacking isolation inside of the kernel, the robustness was quite bad. So an error in one comp component of the kernel, like the device drivers, kills the complete system. And if you consider a loadable device driver that is loaded into kernel address, this has access to the whole kernel address space, so to all other kernel subsystems. So since many device drivers actually came from external contributors, so for example, a disk controller driver was written by the manufacturer of that disk controller and not by the developers of the kernel, these developers were not as experienced in uh, developing operating systems code. So people were really struggling with uh, low quality device drivers code that they nevertheless had to use because it was the only way to actually use the devices they had bought. Performance uh, was pretty high because you only had one address space in the kernel. You didn't have to copy data around, but you just could pass a pointer around to data structure because all kernel components just use the same address space. However, system calls require a trap and sometimes copying data from user's address space to kernel address space as a consequence. So this was a bit slower. So if we discuss monolithic systems, uh, we can conclude that complex monolithic kernels are actually pretty difficult to work with. So adding or changing functionality involves more modules than you imagined, because if you add something in one corner of the system, that might have unexpected consequences in a completely different subsystem. And because this is not isolated from your subsystem, you maybe have to make changes in that other subsystem too to achieve your intended functionality. You have a shared address space inside of the kernel, so if you have a security problem like a buffer overflow in one component, this can affect the complete system, which is of course not what you want. And uh, in addition, many components that are implemented in system mode would not have to run in system mode, so they're just uh, running in system mode for convenience and not because they're required to run in system mode. So essentially, this gives uh, well, errors, a greater possibility to actually show up, and attackers trying to exploit security problems, a larger attack surface, which is not what you want. In addition, uh, monolithic systems often have a reduced number of options for synchronization. So, since you have this single address space inside of your kernel, you can modify, well, all data in your system, like structures or whatever. So, essentially, when you want to do this, you have to lock access to these data structures. And very early Unix systems actually did this in a very simple way. So when uh, some flow of control entered the kernel, the kernel set a so-called big kernel lock. And this kernel lock prevented all other code to enter the kernel. So all other processes trying to execute system calls were blocking. They had to wait until that system uh, operation that had uh, set the big kernel lock initially has finished and had released this big kernel lock. And so uh, a single process could run in kernel mode at a time only, all others had to wait. And this was especially bad for the performance of multiprocessor systems. And this was another big challenge in software engineering for operating systems, actually to change this big kernel lock into a large number of fine granular, small kernel locks, just protecting a single data structure like your process table inside of your kernel, instead of just protecting all data of the kernel at the same time. And of course, having more fine granular locking enabled several processes working on several different things and the kernel at the same time. So especially if you have different CPUs, you had less waiting time for locks to be released. So you could exploit your hardware better. But this was the source, especially in Linux, 
of a large number of, of problems. And I remember the first talk I gave at a German Linux Congress in the late 1990s was when I bought my first multiprocessor PC system. So it was a dual processor, 133 megahertz Pentium machine, and then figured out, oh yeah, it's not that much faster because of that big kernel lock. And then I started investigating all the early Linux patches for fine granular locks and probably caught most of the bugs that were introduced along the way. Because as you've seen in our lecture on synchronization, locking is a difficult problem, especially since you can cause deadlocks or you can forget to lock a data structure in one of the code passes. And all of these result in errors which are hard to find and even harder to debug. So with this experience with monolithic operating systems as the background, researchers started to investigate if it was possible to build operating systems where the amount of code that was critical, so running in kernel or system mode, could be reduced as much as possible. And this idea was uh, culminating in development called microkernel systems. So the objective was to reduce what we call the trusted computing base. So essentially the amount of code and data uh, in relation that actually was able to execute trusted functions. So if there was a bug or a security problem in that code, well, uh, the amount of code was lower. So the expectation was that also the amount of errors would be reduced. So the objective was to minimize the functionality running in the privileged mode of the CPU, and then having all other components run in user mode like regular processes. And since they were running in user mode, you were able to isolate them from the kernel and also against each other. And one important principle that was introduced with microkernel technology was the so-called principle of least privilege. And that's a very important principle. So system functions are only allowed to have the privileges required to complete their task. So for example, if you have a program executing LS, it should not be able to format your hard disk, no matter what. So it should not be able to, for example, uh, call a system call that would delete a file because LS never would be required to delete a file. That's just a simple example, obviously. Now, because uh, you had components of your operating system running in user mode instead of in one large address space, you had to communicate between your components. So, for example, your file system needed to be able to request blocks from your block device driver for your hard disk. So now uh, you had system calls requesting functionality from the operating system. So an application requested something using a system call as before, but between your components of the operating system, like file systems and drivers and so on, you now had to have some other sort of communication because uh, you could no longer just address the other functionalities address space directly. So this uh, communication facility that was introduced between these kernel components was called IPC, so inter-process communication, which is a relatively simple and well-defined form of sending messages between components instead of accessing the other component's memory directly. So this resulted in reduced functionality in the microkernel. So the microkernel code size could be reduced again compared to these large monolithic systems. So we've seen 7th edition Unix, the kernel was about 10,000 lines of code. That was in 1979. Uh, by 1980, it was at least an order of magnitude or two lower, uh, higher. So it, uh, a monolithic kernel had grown to like 100,000 to a million lines of code. So microkernels actually achieved to go down to around 10,000 lines of code again. So for example, the L4 microkernel uh, is around 10,000 lines of C++ code. Uh, compared to five and a half million lines of C code in Linux without considering any of the device drivers. And because these systems were again small, this allows also for formal verification of the correctness of the behavior of the microkernel. So there's a version of the L4 microkernel called SEL4 or SEL4, which actually has a formal proof that was done at the University of New South Wales in Gernot Heiser's research group in Australia. However, the first generation of microkernels that was developed in the mid to late 1980s, for example, the uh, Mach, universe, uh, Mach uh, operating system uh, developed by Carnegie Mellon University in the US, had quite a number of drawbacks. So the init initial idea was actually to take an existing monolithic kernel, like the BSD Unix kernel Mach was based on, 
and then split it into components which are really relevant, so they were part of the microkernel, and other components which did not have to run in kernel mode, so they were actually then relegated to user mode. Now the problem is that in BSD Unix, like in many monolithic Unix kernels, there were lots of complex interdependencies. So this top-down approach of splitting an existing system uh, was difficult. So the objective was to create an extremely portable system. So the idea was that everything running in uh, user mode, so like file systems, for example, would not require any porting to a different system. So only a very small microkernel would need to be adapted if you switched to a different processor platform, a different hardware platform. And so they were trying to uh, apply some improvements to Unix concepts. So instead of just reading and writing memory using pointers, they, they introduced IPC functionality, so new communication methods. Uh, so inter-process communication in Mach was using so-called ports. Ports are secure IPC communication channels, so you could not just send a message to any component of the system requesting a service, but you needed the so-called port write to use it, which is more or less just a magic number, which could be allocated and also deallocated on demand when you were no longer allowed to use the service. This IPC, since it was just messages, was optionally then made network transparent, so back in the 1980s, distributed systems research was a very big research topic in computer science. So the idea was, can we actually build an operating system that's not only controlling one computer, but a network of computers? So we had support for distributed systems, so we could actually request an operation using IPC running on a different machine, which would maybe have uh, well, uh, the ability to share resources with the machine we were using. Another uh, interesting addition of Mach was that it allowed parallel activities inside of a single process address space. So back then, monolithic Unix systems had no notion of threads. They had processes, and a process back then only had one thread of control. And Mach introduced multi-threading. So a process now was relegated to be a container, and a process then was the address space and the well, permissions environment for a set of execution threads. So essentially, when you started a process in Mach, you would also have to start at least one thread in order to execute your program. So it was just a split of concept, though the implementation wasn't that much different. But since you had multi-threading now, you could also split the functionality of a single program to run on multiple processes at the same time, and the late 1980s was also the time when the first multiprocessor systems actually showed up on the market. So Mach was thought to be a good system uh, for systems like these. So uh, the structure of a first generation microkernel based system could look like this. We have the hardware on the bottom again, and we have reduced functionality in the microkernel. So we have IPC handling. So the microkernel is a multiplexer for all mesh, uh, messaging in your system. We also have a system controlling IPC permissions. We have a CPU scheduler. We have device drivers in the microkernel because they were thought to be, well, important because they had direct hardware access. And we have memory management. And then you could have two different approaches of running a system in user mode. So the initial idea was actually to split, for example, a BSD Unix kernel in two halves. So all the important functionality in the microkernel, adding IPC instead of direct memory accesses, and then put all the other functionality in a single monolith monolithic program called a single server in user mode, which was then able to handle standard BSD Unix applications. And so the first single server implemented on top of Mach, where you can get source code for, is the BSD Unix single server, which was just behaving like a regular BSD system. But uh, there was also research on splitting up components in user mode more, because you wanted to have isolation between these different user mode components. So between a file system, for example, and a network protocol stack and so on. So. Uh, that was mostly a research effort, was, uh, which uh, resulted in multi-server operating systems, which actually implemented the functionality of that single server in several processes. So maybe a memory server handling memory allocations, a file system server handling file systems, and a net server, for example, handling TCP IP protocols in separate processes. And if those wanted to communicate with each other, they used IPC, so they sent IPC messages, which were relayed using the microkernel between the different components. And then the application 
had a common view. So essentially what is painted here as direct errors was actually also sending IPC messages to the microkernel, which in turn requested functionality from the respective server. So if you access the file, then your system call was translated into an IPC to your file system server, which then did the operation, for example, reading a block from a file, which was then returned to the application afterwards. Now, unfortunately, uh, the developers of Mach uh, had some problems with their design. So these first generation microkernels especially had the problem that IPC operations were very, very slow. So accessing a memory location in a shared address space is obviously very fast. You just dereference a pointer, uh, whereas sending an IPC operation would require you to change your privilege mode maybe because one of your system components was running in user mode. So essentially you had the overhead of executing a system call. And then in Mach you had very relatively complex structures of these IPCs. So you had to parse them. You had to check for port writes and so on. So uh, this resulted in system calls from user mode processes, which were mapped to IPC calls, being a factor of 10 slower compared to system calls in a monolithic kernel which was obviously pretty much unacceptable. And in addition, the developers of Mach also had some, uh, took some uh, very suboptimal decisions about which components actually should be implemented in the microkernel, which resulted in the microkernel not being that micro at all because the Mach kernel uh, still had a very large code base. And this was especially since device drivers were implemented as part of the microkernel because the developers thought that direct hardware access would require drivers to be in the kernel. And also all the permission management for IPC was happening in the microkernel, which just blew up that code significantly. And this bad performance of the Mach system, though it was used for some commercial Unix systems uh, early on in the late 1980s, late, uh, early 1990s, like the OSF1 operating system by digital for the alpha systems, and also next step for uh, the next company's hardware by Steve Jobs. Uh, this resulted in a pretty bad reputation of microkernels in general, and the practical usability of microkernels was questioned. And as a result, the academic research in microkernels was actually pretty much dead in the mid 1990s. Uh, Mach was used uh, in practice mostly in hybrid systems. So because people didn't want to pay the overhead of like a factor of 10 slower system calls, they actually used this Mach kernel, but they reintegrated parts of what was originally intended to be in user space back into kernel space to take advantage of direct function calls or to even again direct accesses to memory. So just removing all these nice isolation properties again for the sake of performance. So these separately developed components were just co-located again in one address space and uh, in kernel IPC was replaced by function calls. And that's for example what you use nowadays when you use macOS from Apple, so macOS 10. This uses the Mach 3 microkernel developed in the early mid 90s as a basis and it co-locates lots of the FreeBSD kernel source code in the kernel address space for performance. But nevertheless some functionality on the same hardware on Mac OS X is still uh, quite significantly slower. For example, USB transfers still suffer from a lot of overhead that happens because of this Mach-based IPC structure here, which is a bit unfortunate, obviously. But as you can see with this, you can still uh, yeah, build systems that work and can be sold successfully and even run on a mobile phone. So what's running on, on an iPhone or an iPad is also just a Mach kernel. And this Mach kernel is even used for small embedded systems nowadays. So if you happen to buy a video adapter for your iPhone, which is an adapter from the Apple Lightning port to HDMI, and there's a nice article on the web where someone opened it up and figured out this contained a complete ARM-based uh, system on chip running the Mach kernel, which then takes care of translating the protocol to generate HDMI. So it's a really small Unix system running in a $94 video adapter. And that's pretty crazy nowadays. If you want to take a look at the Mach kernel, the Apple kernel source GNU is actually out there on the Apple website, but if you take a look at it, you see it's actually a pretty big mess because all these components are co-located together and it's actually very difficult to get it to compile and, uh, well, to, to understand what's going on, which is a bit unfortunate. So while microkernels were pretty much dead in the US in the early to mid 1990s as a research topic and only used in industry using a lot of clutches, uh, 
uh, there were a number of researchers in Germany who actually believed in the idea of microkernels. And one of these researchers was working in the German National uh, Research Center for Mathematics and uh, Computer Science. And uh, this uh, person was called Jochen Liedke. So Jochen actually had quite some experience in developing operating systems before. Uh, so he developed a number of systems, starting with a system called Eumel Elan, which also included his own Pascal-like programming language running on a virtual machine, uh, similar to the JVM on, on small 8-bit systems. This was very common in some schools in Germany in the 1980s. And he went on to develop uh, further systems. And he, well, was, was really fascinated by this microkernel idea. And so he started trying to figure out what was wrong with these first generation microkernels. And he figured out exactly that problem we described, that IPC was horribly slow. So such an IPC call took several hundreds or even several thousands of processor cycles to execute. Uh, compared to a system call, which was orders of magnitudes faster. So what he did is he started out uh, writing his own microkernel with a focus on optimizing the performance of these interprocess communication operations. And then he was very radical in the ideas of what should be part of his microkernel and what should not be allowed to be part of his microkernel. So Jochen actually stated that any concept is tolerated inside of his microkernel only if moving the same concept outside of the kernel, so to user space, would prevent the implementation of functionality required in the system. So it's no longer a performance or convenience question, it's just a question of would your system still be able to function if you moved that functionality outside of the system, and if it would actually able, be able to function, then you move it outside of your microkernel and try to find ways to do performance optimizations here. And so, uh, Jochen Liedke used four basic mechanisms in designing L4. So the name is uh, L4 because L4 Liedke and 4 because it was the fourth iteration of his operating system. So the previous system was called L3, obviously, and the other systems, Eumel, Elan, had different names here. So L4 actually just provides four mechanisms. It provides a view and an abstraction of address spaces for processes. It provides an execution context by providing a mod model for threads. It provides synchronous inter-process communication between these threads and it provides mechanisms for performing processor scheduling. So device drivers, for example, are no longer part of the microkernel. Checking IPC privileges is no longer part of the microkernel. So much of the functionality that made first generation microkernels like Mach very slow uh, because it uh, was uh, and large because it was implemented in kernel mode uh, now runs in user mode. And one example, which is maybe a bit unexpected, is checking the IPC communication permissions. But this can run in user mode because you don't need direct access to the hardware to do this. You just need to do it in a performant way. And so a system based on a second generation microkernel would look very similar to a system running on a first generation microkernel. But as you notice, there's fewer components in the kernel. So checking IPC permissions and device drivers, for example, would also now be part of the multi-server OS, so several comp separate components of the multi-server OS. You can still run a single server on such a second generation microkernel. And that was done, for example, in the master's thesis of a, a student in Dresden, uh, Michael Homuth, who uh, created L4 Linux, which was a single server Linux adapted to run on the L4 microkernel version that was developed in, at the Technical University of Dresden back then. Uh, and this was, yeah, had quite some impact because uh, they were able to show that in most cases, this Linux running on top of L4 was at most a single digit percentage slower than uh, a native Linux running on the same hardware. And in some cases, they were even able to improve the performance because they could use some sort of optimizations, which I don't want to go into detail here. So essentially, building the system L4 as a microkernel and then running a complete Unix system as a monolithic server on top of this showed that second generation microkernels were actually a feasible concept. And now L4 is running in several billion devices nowadays, for example, as the operating system in uh, wireless modems, in mobile phones, and in very many embedded devices, for example. So L4 is one of the more or less unknown German uh, research uh, oper uh, operating systems research successes. 
And it's interesting because most of the research is still open source. You can just use it. It's very portable. There's uh, an, a large number of different approaches and, and different implementations of L4, but they all have in common that they're very minimal and still based on that initial work by Jochen Liedke uh, in the early to mid 1990s. So if we evaluate microkernels, we see that the isolation, especially for second generation multi-server based uh, systems is very good. We have separate address spaces for all components. Uh, the interaction mechanism is just uh, optimized to be synchronous, optimized, speed optimized inter-process communication. Interrupt handling is also mapped to inter-process communication. So the microkernel actually just receives all interrupts. And when you want to handle interrupts, you register this interrupt using another IPC call to the microkernel. And then this microkernel in turn, whenever this interrupt arrives, sends you an IPC message. So handling interrupts is just like handling any other IPC message in your application now or in your driver. The adaptability, especially of second generation microkernels was originally very bad because the original L4 microkernel was written in x86 assembler for performance. So Jochen Liedke was a guy who actually had the whole source code, like 10,000 lines of assembler for his system in his head. And he wrote most of this himself. And so you could actually ask him, tell him a file name and a line number, and he could ask you what this line of assembler code at that line in his kernel was doing. Now, this is hard to port, obviously, and this is hard to maintain. So subsequent research, which was also caused by frustration because the German National Research Center for Mathematics and Computer Science didn't allow the original L4 source code to be published, and it's still unavailable, unfortunately. So people just re-implemented it because the microkernel was small. So it could actually be managed by a university research group. So several research groups actually started re-implementing L4 and they didn't do it in assembler, but some groups did it in C. Some other groups like the Dresden group re-implemented in uh, uh, the L4 microkernel in C++. And on the way, they implemented many improvements. So L4 has changed significantly over the last like 25 years. But the basic design ideas of Liedke, which was stated on the previous slide, they still hold and people even try to make this kernel more minimal. So uh, nowadays the kernel is easy to adapt and easy to extend because it's written in C or C++. And uh, accordingly the extensibility is very good because you can just add a single component in user space now and this communicates using standard IPC. But of course your system now is dependent on the robustness of user mode components because you can't do a lot just with a running microkernel. So if a number of user mode components crash, like your file system driver, your microkernel can continue to run, but it won't help if you can't access any files. So of course, overall, you still have dependencies between all the components, but at least it's easier to isolate it. And as we've seen, the performance of the overall system uh, is in general very much depending on the IPC performance. So because of all these optimizations Jochen Liedke initially did and all the other researchers after him, uh, actually microkernels turned from an academic research result into a really feasible product nowadays, which is used in billions of devices every day. But of course, research didn't just stop with microkernels. So some researchers in the US actually tried to wonder uh, or wondered like, uh, can we build an even smaller kernel? So from microkernel, they got smaller into the exokernel OS. And the idea was really to simplify the OS even further. So we've seen at the beginning, the major task of an operating system is to do resource multiplexing. And so actually they went back to the very beginning of allowing an application direct access to the hardware, of allowing an application to directly drive the hardware, but to provide a facility to separate this functionality. So to isolate resource accesses from different applications running at the same time, even if they directly access hardware. So they had separate access permissions to part of the hardware. So this means that the lowest system software layer, this exokernel, no longer implements any strategies or abstractions. And it also does not try to virtualize resources. It only has one single task, which is resource partitioning. So every application on this exokernel system is assigned its own set of resources, which is enforced by the exokernel. And everything else is implemented according to the application demand using application specific library operating systems inside of these resource containers.
Well, this was an interesting research experience that never really caught on in that way, because especially these library operating systems, again, are then specific to the respective exokernel and to the respective hardware. So we reintroduced some of the problems we had in these very early computing systems uh, that had the applications or library OS bring their own drivers with them. But now at least we could securely multiplex uh, this among different processes running at the same time. Still, the papers on exokernels are quite interesting to read because this was just trying to push, well, the operating systems to the minimum extreme. However, one related idea caught on and is used very much today, and this idea is called virtualization. So the objective of virtualization is to actually provide a layer below the operating system itself that enables us to isolate and multiplex resources. So that sounds essentially like an, uh, yet another operating system, but uh, we can see virtualization of a, as a method to actually uh, yeah, uh, be an operating system for running different operating systems on top. So essentially this allowed the use of multiple what we call guest operating systems at the same time. So when you want to, when you have your computer and you have a Linux system and you also need to run Microsoft Word, which runs in Windows, you would be able to run a Windows installation in parallel on the same computer as your Linux runs on and both systems actually never notice that there is another system running because this virtualization layer below the Windows and Linux operating system now creates the illusion that each of the two operating systems has the hardware uh, for its own. So a virtual machine or just VM on system level virtualizes hardware resources. Uh, so all the resources we would usually virtualize in a regular operating system. So this includes processors, main memories, mass storage resources, IO devices and so on. And the component of your virtual machine that actually uh, coordinates all the execution of uh, the different operating systems running on top of the virtual machine, so device accesses, memory accesses, scheduling and so on, is called a virtual machine monitor, VMM, or just called a hypervisor. And this hypervisor works together with uh, support mostly from the hardware side to create this illusion to the operating systems running on top that they would be running on a machine of, the, of their own. Now virtualization is actually a pretty old topic and this again started with the IBM S360 mainframes in the 1960s because back then there were many different operating systems in use and of course if you bought an expensive machine you didn't want to buy a second machine just to run a different operating system. So you had systems like DOS 360 and MVS which were simple batch processing library operating systems from very early 360 systems from the smallers. You had the OS 360 plus uh, the interactive option we've talked about so an interactive multi-user system and many customers implemented their own operating systems or extensions and you usually could only afford one big computer so of course you didn't want to reboot your computer uh, to run batch processing jobs to boot DOS 360 or MVS uh, because your interactive users who wanted to use the system at the same time would be pretty angry at you if you shut down the system while they were using it interactively. So the problem IBM had was how to enable customers to use all these operating systems simultaneously on a computer that cost several millions of US dollars. Uh, because back then, of course, the operating systems expected to have control over the complete hardware. So the challenge for IBM was to maintain this illusion for every single operating system that should be running on that machine, even though several should now be able to run at the same time. And this resulted in the development of this first system virtualization called simply VM for virtual machine as a combination of emulating certain features and also introducing first pieces of hardware support to increase the performance of this. And this enabled the simultaneous operation, for example, of batch processing in the background where it wasn't critical how long it took and interactive sessions where response time of your system was more important because you didn't want to wait for like 10 seconds until the character corresponding to your key press on the terminal appeared on the screen. So virtualization with such a type 1 hypervisor, so running directly on the hardware, would look like this. The hypervisor would provide a number of device drivers again, because you cannot allow uh, any guest OS to directly control, for example, the disk controller, because the other operating system running on top would also assume 
that it has direct control of the disk controller. So you would need device drivers. You would have to provide facilities to split the memory between your VMs. Uh, you would have to provide a scheduler to uh, uh, schedule the CPU. And of course, uh, today operating systems want network access. So you also have to multiplex your network connection and root network packets to the respective virtual machine they belong to. So uh, then you can start several VMs. So these VMs have drivers that uh, talk to these uh, virtual device drivers for virtual hardware here. And then it runs uh, the guest OS, sometimes unmodified, because the uh, device driver interactions are actually intercepted and remapped to the device drivers in the hypervisor. And then you can run regular Linux ap applications, for example, on the first VM. And on the second VM, you could, build, um, for example, put a Windows system and then run Windows applications on that one. So uh, your hypervisor still runs in system mode, your applications run in user mode, and depending on the system, well, the VMs might run in some sort of system mode or not. Uh, so this depends on the VM implementation. In addition, now you have a component called the management console, and the management console is just some sort of access to the system, which allows you to start a VM, to stop a VM, to reboot it, uh, to, uh, to create a snapshot, uh, to assign resources, and so on and so forth. And of course, you can start and terminate VMs while the complete system is running without affecting any of the other systems. So you could reboot the Windows in VM2, uh, whereas the uh, Linux in VM1 would continue to run. Now, in order to provide an efficient virtualization, uh, we need some sort of hardware support. This hardware was supported in IBM mainframes, but IBM mainframes are a bit exotic in this respect. Uh, so nowadays you also have this in your regular x86 processors. So this x86 processors have different privilege modes. So we've talked about system mode and user mode. So system mode is usually what's called ring zero in x86 processors. User mode is what is called ring three. So ring three has fewer privileges than code running in, in ring zero. The other rings in between are mostly for historical reasons. And uh, now if you run an operating system, usually this would run in ring zero. So it has full control of the hardware. So if it had full control of the hardware, we would be unable to multiplex our hardware. So Technologies introduced uh, by Intel and AMD uh, called Vanderpool, nowadays VTX, and Pacifica, nowadays called AMDV by AMD, actually uh, solved this problem by adding an additional logical privilege mode, which is very often called ring minus one. So it's even more privileged than ring zero. And now when you enable this ring minus one, which is the ring in which your hypervisor runs, then all instructions that would be critical for sharing the system that is, are executed in ring zero, like disabling interrupts, for example, are now caught. So they're not executed, but they cause a trap to your hypervisor in ring minus one. And then your hypervisor could actually check, is this a legal operation this operating system tries to do? And then can we execute it? Do we need to emulate it? And so on. So guest operating systems kernels like Linux or Windows run in ring zero as before. So this means we don't have to modify them. But any critical instruction executed by these guest operating system kernels in ring zero uh, cause a trap to the hypervisor in ring minus one. The hypervisor then emulates the critical instructions. Or if some uh, operation was attempted that's not allowed, it just stops the operating system running in that virtual machine, whereas all the others can continue to run. And this allows us to use multiple completely unchanged operating system instances on a single hardware system at the same time. But we need to emulate the peripheral devices used by the respective VMs because, well, a direct access to a disk controller by, well, two uh, operating systems running in parallel, overwriting each other's blocks. That would obviously not be a good idea. So there's quite a bit of overhead in that. An alternative to this hardware supported virtualization is what we call power virtualization. So power virtualization means that the interface between the operating system kernel and the application remains unchanged, but we allow some changes to the kernel that is to be run in a virtual machine. So the virtualized operating system gets a special kernel, and in this special kernel, we actually replace all these critical instructions like disabling interrupts or drivers that directly access hardware by uh, calls to our hypervisor. 
So our guest kernel now can run in a protection ring three, for example, just in user mode. Our hypervisor can run in ring zero, for example, on hardware where this ring one is not available. And everything that would be critical in ring three is actually replaced. So it uh, no longer has to run in system mode, uh, but instead of executing critical instructions, it calls a hypervisor function like a normal application would just call a system call. And uh, there's different ways to do this. You can do this in source code. So this is what the Zen hypervisor requires. For example, if you want to run Linux on top of Zen, there's a specialized power virtualized Linux kernel version where all these replacements have been performed and then replaced by Zen hypervisor interface calls. Uh, but you can also use uh, VMware. For example, there's a product called VMware ESX that runs on uh, directly on the hardware. And this actually adapts these critical instructions when an operating system is loaded inside of a virtual machine by rewriting the binary code of the kernel uh, when uh, the operating system is loaded. So this is a very complex process, but this was what was required to successfully uh, virtualize systems on top of Intel processors when there was no functionality for hardware-based virtualization early on in like the early 1990s. There's an interesting paper actually by the inventors of uh, virtualization of the IBM 360 that uh, described uh, as an investigation uh, why uh, early x86 processors were actually not virtualizable. So what the problems were. So if you want to dig deeper in there, this requires a bit of background in computer architecture, but it's a very interesting read, so I can recommend this. Now, power virtualization actually can uh, result in some performance improvement because now instead of uh, having a privileged instruction uh, requiring a trap to the hypervisor, uh, emulating that instruction, we just directly call the hypervisor telling it what to do. So this can be quite a bit faster, especially since our peripherals can be much simpler now on the power virtualized side because they just have to more or less copy data around instead of uh, controlling registers. So no more slow hardware emulation is required when you use power virtualization. But of course, uh, if you have a closed source operating system, it's difficult to adapt it. And if you do an approach like VMware, that's a lot of overhead you have to invest to get it really to work correctly. So let's evaluate virtualization. Isolation is very good, but it's restricted to isolation between these separate VMs. So your virtualized Linux cannot influence your virtualized Windows and the other way around. But uh, of course, you have monolithic operating system kernels running inside the VM. So everything that uh, holds from monolithic kernels is now welded inside of the VM. The interaction is very much restricted, so very often communication between the VMs only can take place via network protocols, so usually using TCP IP, using some virtual network cards. Interrupt handling uh, is managed by forwarding the IRQs to the guest kernel inside of the VM. Uh, if you have simulated hardware, then you actually simulate an interrupt uh, to the device driver running inside of the VM. Uh, you need uh, to adapt the VM, the hypervisor, to a specific CPU type. And uh, power virtualization needs a lot of overhead to adapt it correctly. Extensibility is difficult and not available commonly in VMMs, so you only want to run existing systems inside of a VM. You don't want to use it as a basis to develop new systems. The robustness is pretty much good, but of course still restricted to the VM granularity. So if something crashes your Linux system running in a VM, your Windows system running in the other VM would continue to run. And performance is amazingly good. So uh, it's about 5 to 10% slower usually compared to direct execution on the same hardware, which is pretty much reasonable. Now, finally, you might have heard of a completely different approach to doing operating systems. So to build an operating system, which actually includes only the functionality that a certain application uses. And this is very much uh, used in cloud environments, where you just allocate a VM, for example, on Amazon's EC2 cloud, and then just tailor an application together with the required kernel components to whatever is exactly required to run your application and nothing else. This improves performance because you can link all of this together again because it's just one single application running in a VM that can directly call functions again, like in early library operating systems. And uh, you reduce the attack surface because code that's just not included in your system 
cannot be hacked, obviously. Um, these systems are called unikernels nowadays. So these are used to efficiently execute a single application inside of a virtual machine. And there's different, well, systems providing such a unikernel library operating system. Uh, some examples are Mirage OS, Mini OS, Unicraft, but there are lots of them outside. So this was a development that, well, came up in the last like uh, five to 10 years. And one early example of such a functionality was the uh, OS kit by the University of Utah. And this actually just collected the best of different open source operating system components. So you see, you have uh, file systems from Linux, a TCP IP stack from FreeBSD, another uh, file system from NetBSD, a window manager from somewhere, some scheduler, some drivers from Linux and from FreeBSD and so on. And these were reused and integrated into an overall system, which should provide a system like similar to Lego, where you could click your components you needed together and yeah, mix and match whatever you wanted in your system. And so the OS kit actually took care to adapt the different interfaces. So device driver interfaces for Linux look a bit different than those for FreeBSD, for example. So to adapt them to conform for us to a single standard. And then when you wanted to build extensions for this, you had uh, some language support for C, a so-called interface generator to enable easy integration of components. So this was a pretty interesting system like 20 years ago. And uh, some other systems like these exist nowadays. So for example, there was a PhD thesis again from Finland, where a student built a system called a RUMP kernel, which enabled you to use parts of the NetBSD operating system kernel code to actually build a unikernel of your own supporting for example, a single application to run in a cloud. So if you're interested, there's a, a PhD thesis out there and the code for this also out there if you want to run things on cloud systems. So to conclude our discussion of OS architectures here, we've seen going from library operating systems to monolithic operating systems to micro exit kernels and hypervisors, we're now somehow back at library operating systems for cloud applications. So operating system architectures are still a current area of research and very old techniques such as 1960s virtualization find no new applications, for example, in cloud computing, where you can now, uh, well, buy computing time on demand. So we're also back to paying for seconds or hours of CPU time if you, uh, whatever, rent a virtual machine on the EC2 cloud. Hardware and applications change all the time. So now we have to build systems which are anywhere, energy aware, uh, like mobile phones or embedded systems, or even do energy harvesting, where you don't know how much energy will have available. You need to enable scalability. So, well, processors the, or systems that were like single processor systems 20 years ago have now may have 64 processors on a single chip, like with the most recent AMD processors. You can be heterogeneous, so you can have like ARM systems with big and little cores, like on the Apple M1s. You can have GPUs integrated or even FPGAs, and you want to, ex uh, to make use of them as, as good as possible. And you even want your code to be adaptable. So Linux or even the macOS kernel runs on systems from small embedded systems or mobile phones uh, uh, up to, well, servers and desktops in the case of macOS and even co complete supercomputers in uh, well, the case of Linux and with very many different use cases. So running a Java based Android system on top of Linux for Android phones uh, or running just a regular C user land for your desktop and so on. Uh, you might have additional challenges coming up in the future. So one of our research areas is in persistent main memories, which also show up not only in microcontrollers like FRAM on TI MSP430 microcontrollers, but also in regular memory modules. So what happens if your uh, memory, your RAM, no longer loses information when you shut down a machine or power it up or it crashes? This has some interesting consequences. Now, the problem is that you want to do something new. There's a whole large amount of software that relies on running on a specific operating system like Windows or Linux. So compatibility requirements and really high development costs nowadays prevent the fast acceptance of new developments. So very much of these new, very many of these new developments actually are in academia, but sometimes uh, really companies start out like Google trying to replace the Linux kernel with their own micro kernel called Faxia uh, as a new base for an Android uh, Android follow-up system and so on. So people are trying this all the time. Some succeed, 
uh, some uh, actually gave up. So Apple tried to base macOS 10 on the L4 microkernel and canceled that project after a number of years. And there were a number of research projects at Microsoft uh, trying to build a multi-server OS based on the uh, .NET C Sharp virtual machine. This was a nice research system which resulted in, in great publications, but very few of these results actually show up in Windows nowadays. So nevertheless, uh, operating systems seem to be sort of uh, long-term projects usually. So if you're interested in this, there's lots of interesting research topics. And uh, if you want to dig deeper, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, we can provide you with much more information. So some of the information related to today's lecture can be found in these literature references. So starting with the uh, book by Fred Brooks about the OS 360 development, the paper by uh, a number of people uh, from Carnegie Mellon University about the Mach kernel. One of those you might recognize, so A.V. Tuvanian, uh, later on went to work for Apple as the head of operating systems development. Uh, he was one of the inventors of Mach, obviously. Jochen Liedke published a large number of papers on his L3 and L4 kernels, especially L4. Unfortunately, Jochen passed away about 20 years ago already, far too early. But uh, there are uh, more people continuing this tradition in Germany, in Australia and elsewhere. So L4 is still very much an active research topic. Um, some people uh, in the US built the exekernel idea and they're still active in doing operating systems research. So papers by, by Franz Kasuk and uh, Doug Engler are, are very interesting to read. They have great ideas. So uh, two of the guys who worked on the IBM 360 virtualization already were uh, Goldberg and Popek, and they actually formalized the requirements this, uh, uh, that state when a certain hardware architecture is actually virtualizable. Uh, so when there's enough hardware support to provide virtualization compared to when you have to adapt code to securely virtualize your system. And the final paper is about the Utah Flux OS kit. This first or one of the first ideas to really build some, some sort of, of a construction kit for building operating systems from different components that were collected from all over different operating systems out there. So I hope you found this interesting. We'll continue discussing some uh, cloud systems in the next lecture, and then we'll dig into additional topics like embedded systems, energy awareness, and we'll have a big block on security towards the end of the semester. So thanks for listening, and until next time, bye.